James Cardinal Gibbons, the faith of our fathers, states, a sacrament is, quote, a visible sign instituted by Christ by which grace is conveyed to our souls. Three things are necessary to constitute a sacrament, a visible sign, invisible grace, and that it was instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to give you a few passages from the Catechism of the Catholic Church to expand just for a moment on the concept of sacrament. From paragraph 774, the seven sacraments are the signs and instruments by which the Holy Spirit spreads the grace of Jesus Christ, the head, throughout the church, which is his body. In other words, it is through the sacraments that the grace merited by Jesus Christ is applied to our lives by the Holy Spirit. In paragraph 1084, seated at the right hand of the Father and pouring out the Holy Spirit on his body, which is the church, Christ now acts through the sacraments he instituted to communicate his grace. Again, these sacraments that the church has are sacraments instituted by Jesus Christ himself. Paragraph 1116, sacraments are actions of the Holy Spirit at work in Christ's body, the church. Actions of the Holy Spirit. And one last one from the Catechism, paragraph 1127. In them, the sacraments, in them Christ himself is at work. Again, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is at work in the sacraments which he instituted. I think these passages give you a good feel for what the church teaches regarding the sacraments. They are not magic. They are not items on a checklist of works that Catholics have to do which automatically get us into heaven. They are the means by which Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, communicates His grace, the grace which He merited, to the members of His body, the church. They are the means through which we, the members of the body of Christ, can grow in holiness. They're kind of like the blood in a human body. It is through the blood that the cells of the body receive nourishment, receive life. It is through the sacraments that we receive grace, that we receive the very life of God himself. In a human body, if you are cut off from the blood, if any part of the body is cut off from the blood, it dies. If any cell is cut off from the blood in a human body, it dies. In the mystical body, the body of Christ, the church, we can cut ourselves off from the blood of Christ, from the sacraments, by sinning. Sin keeps God's grace from working in our lives. If we remain in a state of sin, eventually we will die and be cut off from the body. And if you really think about it, Protestants should not have a problem with this concept of sacraments. Because you will often hear them say, I have been washed in the blood of Christ. Well, ask them how this is so since Jesus died 2,000 years ago. How were they washed in the blood of Christ? You'll probably get a response like, well, I received Jesus into my heart and he washed me in his blood. But how did he wash you in his blood? Is Jesus still bleeding? No. No. He did it through the Holy Spirit, you might hear. But how through the Holy Spirit? No ultimate answer is to be heard as to the how on this question. Not from a Protestant. Catholics, however, have an answer to the how. The sacraments. It is through the sacraments that Jesus washes us in his blood. That he gives us grace. His grace. It is basically the same concept. So we as Catholics need to start explaining these things in terms that our non-Catholic brothers and sisters can understand, terms that they can relate to. And let me just state one more thing before we start with the sacrament of baptism. There are non-Catholic Christians who believe in some sort of sacramental system. For example, the Eastern Orthodox have the same seven sacraments that Catholics have. Also, a Lutheran or an Episcopalian would be familiar with the concept of sacraments. 
as would, to a lesser degree, Methodists and Presbyterians and maybe a few other denominations. Although none of these Protestant denominations believe in the sacraments exactly the same way that Catholics do. However, the vast majority of evangelicals, fundamentalists, and non-denominationalists will have nothing to do with the concept of sacrament. And it's to these folks you will often find yourself defending the teaching of the church in this area. Now, let's start with baptism. Most Protestants believe that baptism is merely symbolic. It is simply a gesture that the already saved person makes to the community to show his or her commitment to Christ. It is symbolic and nothing else. There is no washing of sin, no infusion of grace, nothing of the supernatural. Catholics, on the other hand, believe that baptism is not merely symbolic. We believe that through baptism, our sins are washed away. Through baptism, Jesus Christ communicates sanctifying grace to us. Through baptism, we are spiritually reborn and made members of the body of Christ. Through baptism, we are saved. So who's right? Is baptism symbolic? Or does it communicate grace and do all the other things that Catholics believe it does? Since we're probably talking to someone who accepts only the Bible as authoritative in matters of faith, then let's open up the Bible. First, let's look at the Protestant position. Is baptism symbolic? Well, what does the Bible say? You can turn in your Bibles and keep turning in your Bibles and keep turning in your Bibles. And you know what? You won't find a single verse in the Bible that says baptism is symbolic. Nor will you find a single verse in the Bible that says baptism is to be done as a symbolic act to show one's commitment to Christ. Now, this is important to remember because, as I said, we're probably talking to folks who believe the Bible is the sole rule of faith for the Christian If they believe that baptism is symbolic, then the Bible ought to say that, don't you think? The Bible ought to explicitly, explicitly say that, but it doesn't. So if someone tells you that baptism is merely symbolic, ask them to show you just one verse in the Bible that explicitly states that, that baptism is symbolic. They won't be able to do it because that verse does not exist. Remember, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere does the Bible use the terminology that baptism is symbolic. Nowhere does the Bible use the terminology that baptism is merely a symbolic act to show one's commitment to Christ. This is a very important point to remember. Next, let's look at the Catholic position. Does baptism wash away sin? And through baptism, do we receive the Holy Spirit? Well, what does the Bible say? Let's start in the Old Testament. If you turn to the book of Ezekiel, it's right in the middle of the Bible. Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27. Here in Ezekiel, this is a prophecy in these passages. Ezekiel 36, starting verse 25. God says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will put my spirit within you. One thing to note here. Quite often, if you quote the Old Testament to support some Catholic teaching, you might be told that, well, that's the Old Testament. That doesn't apply anymore. Jesus' death on the cross did away with the Old Testament law. We go by what it says in the New Testament. I have heard that many, many times. If someone does say that to you, simply turn to 2 Timothy 3.16 and show them what it says there. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, 
and for training in righteousness. All scripture. So remember, the Old Testament is, number one, inspired by God. Number two, it is profitable for teaching. And number three, it is profitable for training in righteousness. Remember, folks, the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of the New Testament. It's not completely divorced from the New Testament. It is a foreshadowing of what's to come in the New Testament. As St. Augustine says, the New Testament is hidden in the Old. The Old Testament is revealed in the New. So, coming back to Ezekiel, what does this passage teach us? How does it train us in righteousness? I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will put my spirit within you. Hmm. What do we have? We have someone sprinkled with water, and through that action, they are made clean from their uncleannesses, and they receive God's spirit. Well, this passage from the Old Testament shows us that God, by his own design, God's design now, not man's, God, by his own design, uses an outward sign, the sprinkling of water, to bring about an inward change in his people. Sound familiar? And what is that inward change? Cleansing from uncleannesses and giving a new heart and a new spirit and putting God's spirit within the people who were sprinkled with this clean water. Sounds kind of um, sacramental, don't you think? So here in the Old Testament, we have a foreshadowing of New Testament baptism. Now, let's move on to the New Testament and see if what we find here corresponds to what we just read in Ezekiel. Turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 38, quote, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. First note that there is no symbolic language here. This is real. The book of Acts says, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Ezekiel says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from your uncleannesses. The book of Acts says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel says, and I will put my spirit within you. Do you begin to see how God in the old covenant was preparing us for what he gives us in the new covenant? And turn forward a few pages to Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Scripture very plainly tells us that baptism washes away sin just as the Catholic Church teaches and that through baptism we receive the Holy Spirit, just as the Catholic Church teaches. Is it through baptism that we become members of the body of Christ, that we become Christians, as the Church teaches? Or do we become Christians by accepting Jesus Christ into our lives as our personal Lord and Savior, as many non-Catholic Christians believe? Well, again, what does the Bible say? Once again, we find no direct support for the non-Catholic position. There is no passage, no passage in the Bible that says we become Christian by accepting Jesus Christ into our hearts as our personal Lord and Savior. That passage does not exist. If anyone ever tells you this, simply ask them to show you that passage in the Bible that contains those words accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's not there. Now then, the church teaches that it is extremely important to have a personal relationship with Christ. But, as the example of Judas shows us, it is possible to have a personal relationship with Jesus and still end up rejecting Jesus and betraying Jesus. So it is not a personal relationship alone 
that makes us Christians. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Just after the book of Romans. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. What body was that? The body of Christ. As we see in Galatians 3, 27. Quote, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Baptism makes us members of the body of Christ. Baptism is the entrance into the new covenant with God, just as circumcision was the entrance into the old covenant with God. Scripture makes this connection for us. In Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12. Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12. Quote, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. And you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him. Baptism makes us members of the body of Christ. Baptism makes us Christians. Baptism is the entrance into the new covenant. Does baptism save us? as the Catholic Church teaches. Well, once again, what does the Bible say? In 1 Peter 3, verses 20 and 21, it's talking about, makes an allusion to Noah and the ark. 1 Peter 3, verse 20 and 21. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, that's Noah and his family, were saved through water. How were they saved? Through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Baptism saves you. The Bible can't be any more clear on that point. And in John chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God born of water and the Spirit. Baptism. We need baptism in order to enter the kingdom of God, in order to be saved. And if anyone says that Jesus wasn't talking about baptism when he says born of water and the Spirit, that he was talking about natural birth and birth in the Spirit, when he says born of water and born of the Spirit, the water, of course, they would be saying is the placental fluids inside the womb. I've heard that. Ask them, say, where in Scripture does it say that water refers to the placental fluids? Where? It doesn't, ever. That is not reading Scripture in context. That is an interpretation that is not supported by the context of Scripture especially when you consider that immediately after saying this to Nicodemus, that you must be born of water and the Spirit, in John chapter 3, if you go down a few verses to John 3, verse 22, it says, after he ended his conversation with Nicodemus now, get the context, Jesus went into the land of Judea, there he remained with his disciples and baptized. He went out baptizing. Baptism is the context within which Jesus says you must be born of water and the Spirit. And it's water baptism. You have to read Scripture in context. And if you look at all the accounts of Jesus' baptism in all four Gospels, Jesus is baptized with water. And what happens when he comes up out of the water? The Spirit descends upon him. Water and the Spirit. Baptism. Now one last point on baptism. In Matthew 28, verse 19, what does Jesus say in his final instructions to the apostles? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, getting them to accept me into their hearts as their personal Lord and Savior. No. It says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Why? Why is baptism given such paramount importance in Jesus' final instructions to the apostles 
if it is only symbolic. That makes no sense whatsoever. Scripture does not support the non-Catholic notion that baptism is symbolic. Scripture does, however, very directly and very clearly in the Old Testament and the New support the Catholic teaching that baptism saves us, that baptism makes us members of the body of Christ, that baptism washes away sin, and that through baptism we receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's move on to confession. Most Protestants, if not all, believe you should confess your sins straight to God. Forget all this nonsense of going through a priest. Again, always ask the question, what does the Bible say? Again, let's start in the Old Testament, remembering 2 Timothy 3.16, which says that all Scripture is profitable for teaching and training in righteousness. If you turn to Leviticus chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, Leviticus would be what? third book of the Bible. Chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. When a man is guilty in any of these, he shall confess the sin he has committed, and he shall bring his guilt offering to the Lord for the sin which he has committed, and the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. So, what does this passage from Leviticus teach us? How does it train us in righteousness? First, we see that to be forgiven, we have to confess our sins. No problem there. Second, it looks as if there is penance to be performed after our sins are confessed. A guilt offering was brought to the Lord. Third, a person could not go straight to God to have his sins forgiven. God set things up so that people had to go to a priest. Why did God do that? Again, if someone says, well, that's the Old Testament, we're not bound by that anymore. 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy 3.16, but also you can go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, which says, for since the law, talking about the Old Testament law, has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities. The law, the Old Testament practices were a shadow of the true form of the good things to come. So the Old Testament practices should give us a hint or a clue as to the equivalent New Testament practices, since they are a shadow of the things to come. In other words, in the Old Covenant, God was in effect training us, training his people, giving us clues for what was to come under the new covenant. So again, we see confession of sin, penance, and the involvement of the priest in the Old Testament. Now, moving to the New Testament, 1 John 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But, does it say that we are con to confess our sins to God alone and not to man? No, it doesn't say that. In fact, in James 5, verse 16, it commands us to confess our sins to each other. Scripture commands us. God's word commands us to confess our sins to our fellow man. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Again, this is a command from Scripture to confess our sins to one another, not just to God. Not just to God. But, do we go around confessing our sins to just anyone? I don't think so. Doesn't it make sense that God would have us confess our sins to those who have the power to forgive our sins? Whoa, wait a minute, John. Are you suggesting that men can forgive sins? Yes, I am. This, this is the major stumbling block for non-Catholic Christians regarding the Catholic teaching on the sacrament of confession. Men forgiving sins. When you get into this discussion, you will be told that only God can forgive sins. 
which is exactly what Catholics believe. However, we believe that God can and does exercise this power through men. Understand that, please. It is God's power, but he exercises that power through men. Now, here's what you can do when someone says that only God can forgive sins, and therefore Catholics are going against Scripture when they confess their sins to a priest. If you turn to Mark chapter 2, verse 7, this is the story of Jesus healing a paralytic. Mark 2, verse 7 says, Why does this man speak thus? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Ask whoever you're talking to if they agree with Scripture regarding that statement that God alone can forgive sins. They will undoubtedly say yes, probably already having said as much. The problem is that that statement came out of the mouth of the scribes. And in this context, it betrays a limited understanding of God's power as Jesus goes on to point out to them. So what you have done is put them on the side of the scribes. And generally speaking, being on the side of the scribes in the scriptures is not a good thing. Now, turn back a few pages to Matthew chapter 9. This is the exact same story of the healing of the paralytic that we were just looking at in Mark chapter 2. Matthew chapter 9. And again, in verse 3, we see it says, The scribe said, This man is blaspheming. And what happens? Jesus shows him that their understanding of God's power is a limited one. In verse 6, Jesus tells them, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. It probably blew their minds. Has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then what does Scripture go on to tell us in verse 8? When the crowd saw it, when they saw Jesus forgive the sins of the paralytic and, and the para he told the paralytic to rise and take up his mat and go home, when the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to a man. If you're following along, you know that's not what it says. It doesn't say God gave such authority to a man. It says God gave such authority to men, plural. Scripture tells us that God gave this authority to men, not just to a man, Jesus Christ, but to men. And what authority did God give them? The authority on earth to forgive sins. I don't know how much plainer it can be. Scripture tells us that God gave men the authority on earth to forgive sins. And should you have any doubts, you can turn to the Gospel of John. John chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. This is on the night of the resurrection. Jesus appears to the apostles, the disciples in the upper room. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, remember that phrase, as the Father has sent me, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Again, verse 21. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. How did the Father send Jesus? We just saw in Matthew 9, 6, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So the Father sent Jesus with the authority on earth to forgive sins. Now, Jesus is sending out the apostles as the Father has sent him. So what authority must the apostles have? The authority on earth to forgive sins. And just in case someone didn't understand him when he said it in verse 21, in verse 23, he can't get much clearer. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Why give the apostles the power to forgive or retain sins unless you expect people to confess their sins to them? Why give the apostles the power to forgive or retain sins unless you expect people to confess their sins to them? How can you forgive and particularly how can you retain sins unless you know what someone's sins are. 
unless they are confessing their sins to you. And as we saw earlier in James 5.16, we are supposed to confess our sins to men, not to God alone. Yes, we confess our sins to God, but the system which God has set up for us to receive his forgiveness involves confessing our sins to men. The Bible is very clear on this. And as we learn from the Old Testament, the priest is an integral part of how God set up the system for receiving forgiveness of sin. Remember that. This is how God set things up, not man. The sacraments are all instituted by Jesus Christ himself. And we have clearly seen that here in Scripture regarding the sacrament of confession. Now, let's talk about the Eucharist. If you heard my talks last summer, a little of this will be familiar to you, but I've expanded on it somewhat. The majority of non-Catholic Christians here in the U.S., and particularly in the South, believe the Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper as it is often referred to, is merely a symbolic act in which we remember in some manner what Jesus did for us. For Catholics, however, it is much, much more. The Eucharist for the Catholic is the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. It is God himself. So the question is, who's right? Is it symbol or is it Christ? Who's to say? Well, once again, why don't we see what the Bible says about it? And once again, let's start with the Old Testament to see what it can teach us and how it can train us in righteousness. If you turn to Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, Malachi is one of the last books of the Bible. Or if you have a Protestant version, it is the last book of the Bible. Malachi chapter 1, verse 11. Quote, For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations, and in every place incense is offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Catholics should be very familiar with this passage because we hear it at Mass all the time, although in a slightly different form. See if this sounds familiar. From east to west, a perfect offering is made. Sound familiar? That's Malachi 1.11. When Malachi was written some 450 years before Christ, God's name was not great among the Gentiles. A pure offering was not being made to him in all the nations. So this is a prophecy of times to come after Jesus Christ. Because it was only after Jesus Christ that the gospel was taken to the Gentiles and that God's name was made great among the Gentiles and among all the nations. As Catholics, we need to be very, very familiar with this passage, and we need to introduce our non-Catholic brothers and sisters to this passage. Look at what it's saying. It is just rich, rich, this one passage. At some future date, the Gentiles, or the nations, will, from the rising of the sun to its setting, Offer pure in offer incense and a pure offering. Hmm. What could they be talking about here? Well, we see that the prophecy says that incense is to be a part of worship, something which most non-Catholic Christians do not believe and do not practice. And we see that the prophecy says a pure offering will be made from the rising of the sun to its setting among all the nations. What is the only pure offering that has ever been made to God? His Son, Jesus Christ, is the only pure offering. What do we do at the Mass? We offer, we represent the offering that Jesus Christ made on the cross to the Father in heaven. And how often does the Mass take place in the church? in the worldwide church, every hour, on the hour, all day long. In other words, from the rising of the sun to its setting. And where does the Mass take place? All around the world, in all the nations. 
This prophecy of Malachi 1.11 is a prophecy that pertains directly to the Mass. Most non-Catholic Christians, particularly evangelicals, fundamentalists, and non-denominationalists have no form of worship which can fulfill this prophecy. We need to make sure that we read and study this passage so that we can get them to read and study this passage. Now let's turn to the New Testament. Turn to John chapter 6, verses 53 to 55. John 6, verses 53 to 55. Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Jesus says his flesh is real food, and that his blood is real drink, and that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood to have life, to have life in us. Catholics believe exactly what Jesus says. We take him literally. Most non-Catholics do not take Jesus literally. We believe what the Word of God is very plainly telling us here. Amen, amen, we say. And put these passages from John together with what Christ said at the Last Supper. This is my body. This is my blood, which we find in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke chapter 22. In all of these accounts of the Last Supper, Jesus uses the word is. Not the words is similar to or is symbolic of, but the word is. This is my body, this is my blood. Now keep one finger on John 6 and turn in your Bibles to what Paul tells us about the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11 verses 23 through 29. Here we see Paul telling us that Jesus himself told Paul about the Last Supper. And Jesus, in his description of the Last Supper to Paul, again used the word is. Now, putting all of these passages together, the passages from the four Gospels and from 1 Corinthians, we get a pretty clear picture from Scripture that Jesus was talking not symbolically, but literally when he said to eat his body and drink his blood. And listen to what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. How can you be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord if it isn't the body and blood of the Lord? And in verse 29, Paul goes on to say, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning the Lord's body? How can you discern the Lord's body if the Lord's body isn't there? If it's only symbolic? Paul was talking literally. Now, turn back to John 6. The standard response you will get from someone when you begin quoting John 6 is that Jesus was actually speaking symbolically because he says there in verse 63, quote, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Well, amen, says the Catholic. I believe that 100%. Yet, Many non-Catholic Christians will say that this verse shows Jesus was speaking symbolically because he says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. He uses the word spirit. See, they say he's talking spiritually or symbolically and not literally. Well, I have to tell you, I have not been able to understand why anyone, why anyone would believe that the word spirit means the same thing as the word symbolic. 
It's not the Father, Son, and Holy Symbolic. And I don't say that to be sarcastic, but to get the point across that nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Scripture does the word spirit mean symbolic. The spirit is as real as it gets. But beyond that, even if John 6, 63, if John chapter 6, verse 63 shows that Jesus was speaking symbolically, then why did his disciples, who knew him better than anyone, save his own mother, walk away from him in verse 66 after they heard his supposedly symbolic explanation? If he was speaking symbolically, why did they walk away? No, they understood him literally, as did the Jews in verse 52, where they say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? As did the apostles in verse 66, when Jesus asked them, will you also go away? What did Peter say? He say, oh no, Lord, we know you're only speaking symbolically. No. Peter said in verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? Peter and the apostles understood Jesus was speaking literally. They didn't understand how what he was saying could be true, but they understood him to be speaking literally, as do Catholics. And another question, if Jesus was not speaking literally, then why did he let so many of his disciples walk away without explaining to them that he was indeed speaking symbolically? And again, why did they walk away if he was speaking symbolically? Time after time after time, the Gospels show us that the disciples were clueless as to what the Master was teaching them. Did any of them leave because of it? No. What happens each and every time? Either the disciples come to Jesus and ask him to explain, or Jesus simply goes to them even without them asking and explains it to them. Just in the book of Matthew, we can find a dozen or so examples of this. In Matthew 13, chapter 13, verse 10, Jesus has just finished teaching, teaching the crowd using the parable of the sower and the seeds. You're all familiar with it. Some seed falls on rocky ground, some seed among the thorns, some seed falls on good soil. In verse 10 it says, Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And then beginning in verse 18, what does Jesus do? He explains the parable to them because they didn't understand it until he did so. In verses 24 to 33 of that same chapter 13, Jesus tells the crowd three more parables. The disciples didn't understand the parables any better than the crowd did. So what happens in verse 36? Do the disciples leave him? No. They come to Jesus and they ask him to explain the parables. We see it again in Matthew 15, verses 15, verse 15, and in Matthew 17, verses 10 and 19. And there are other examples, as I said, in the Gospels showing this exact same thing. But I think you get the point. Whenever the disciples did not understand something, either they came to Jesus and asked him to explain it, or he went to them without them asking and explained what he was saying. But we don't see that happening in John 6. Why? Because Jesus was speaking literally and everyone knew it. Okay, coming back to John 6 again, chapter 6. Let's do something a little bit different. Let's give what Jesus is saying in John 6 a symbolic meaning, a meaning which runs counter to what the Catholic Christian sees in John 6, but fits right in with what the non-Catholic Christian generally sees in these verses. And let's see if this symbolic meaning for Jesus' words makes any sense. Let's read verses 53 to 55 again. Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Again, for the sake of argument, let's say Jesus is speaking symbolically. Okay, first problem. If he's speaking symbolically, then what the heck was he trying to say? How do we symbolically eat his body and symbolically drink his blood? Is he saying we symbolically eat his body and drink his blood by eating a piece of bread and drinking some grape juice? And if we do that, is he saying that we will have eternal life because of it? I don't think any evangelical or fundamentalist would admit that, but that's the language he uses. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. That is quite a promise. So are the folks who say Jesus is speaking symbolically, are they saying that I am guaranteed heaven according to Jesus' promise here? Are they saying that I am guaranteed heaven by symbolically eating Jesus' body and blood? And yet another problem. Verse 60. Many of his disciples, when they heard it, when they heard Jesus say, you must eat his body and drink his blood, many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? If Jesus is speaking symbolically, then why is this a hard saying? And again, as we mentioned earlier, someone might say that at first the disciples misunderstood, but that Jesus cleared it up for them in verse 63 when he says, It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. See, they say Jesus says the words he has spoken are spirit. In other words, they are symbolic. But again, that goes back to the problem we mentioned earlier. If Jesus was explaining in verse 63 that his words were symbolic, then why did many of his disciples reject him and leave him in verse 66? And an interesting little side note here, the disciples leave Jesus in chapter 6, verse 66. 666. Anyway, if this was a symbolic teaching... Why would the disciples walk away? Why would they consider it such a hard teaching that they would walk away? If it were a symbolic teaching, it wouldn't be any harder to accept back then than it would be to accept today. How many people leave Protestant churches after they have been saved because they are then presented with the teaching of having to symbolically eat Jesus' Jesus' body and symbolically drink his blood by eating a piece of bread and drinking some grape juice? I would venture that no one, no one has ever found this symbolic meaning to be a hard teaching in the same way that the disciples did, supposedly did. And I would venture to say that no one has ever left a Protestant church because of this supposedly symbolic teaching, the way the disciples left Jesus. And think about this. These same disciples who walked away from Jesus because of this teaching on eating his body and drinking his blood. What had these same disciples witnessed the day before? In verses 9 through 14 of chapter 6, we see that they had just witnessed the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Jesus had just fed thousands of people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And what else did they see? What else did these same disciples who walked away from Jesus, what else did they see the day before? Verse 19, Verse 19, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat. They had just seen Jesus Christ walking on water. Walking on water. And you think they are going to walk away from him because he just told them they have to symbolically eat his body and blood? I don't think so. And let's think about what else they had seen. They had seen Jesus turn water to wine. They had seen Jesus cure the sick and heal lepers, the blind, the lame. They had seen Jesus cast out demons. They had even cast out demons and healed the sick by the power Jesus had given to them. And they walked away from him because he told them they had to symbolically eat his body and symbolically drink his blood? I don't think so. And again, if you say they misunderstood him and that they even misunderstood his symbolic explanation in verse 63, then why didn't he explain it to them until they did understand, as he had on every other occasion of misunderstanding? 
And why, if not a single person took him to mean what he said as being symbolic? Not a single one of the Jewish leaders and authorities. Not a single one of his disciples. Not a single one of the apostles, people who had been with him day in and day out since the beginning of his ministry. If all the people who were so close to Jesus took him literally, then why does anyone today, 2,000 years after the fact, believe that his words were symbolic? Could it be because it is such a hard teaching, the literal meaning of Jesus' words? Aren't people today rejecting the real meaning of Jesus' words, just as the Jews and many of his disciples rejected the real meaning of Jesus' words 2,000 years ago? Because it is a hard teaching, because it does require a tremendous amount of faith, a tremendous amount of trust in God's word. Let me point out one other thing here. Look at verses 30 and 31 in John 6. The Jews are asking for a sign and they refer to the miracle of the manna from heaven, which God gave the Israelites for food in the desert. And Jesus' response to them in verse 32 and following makes it very clear that he is talking about something greater than, something greater than the miracle of the manna in the desert. And in verse 62, Jesus says to his dis disbelieving disciples, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? Here Jesus is telling us that whatever it is he's talking about is greater than even the miracle of his ascension into heaven. Do you see what I'm saying here? Taking scripture in context, we see that Jesus frames his discussion about eating his flesh and drinking his blood with the miracle of the manna from heaven on one hand, and the miracle of his ascension into heaven on the other hand. And he is clearly pointing to the fact that whatever it is he means by eating his body and drinking his blood, whatever he means by that, it is something that is more miraculous than manna from heaven and more miraculous than his ascension into heaven. I ask you, is eating a piece of bread and drinking some grape juice more miraculous than manna from heaven? Is eating a piece of bread and drinking some grape juice more miraculous than Jesus ascending into heaven in a cloud of glory? I don't think so. But is the bread and wine of the Eucharist being changed into the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, is that a greater miracle than the manna in the desert? Is the bread and wine of the Eucharist being changed into the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ? Is that a greater miracle than his ascension into heaven? I would have to say yes, that it is. In other words, an interpretation of this passage from John 6 and the passages from the Last Supper and the passages from 1 Corinthians, an interpretation which renders these passages as Jesus speaking symbolically, an interpretation which puts the words is symbolic of in Jesus' mouth, when those words are nowhere to be found in these passages, just doesn't make any sense. Everyone took Jesus literally because he was speaking literally, period. And one final point. If we look closely at John 6, verse 58, where Jesus says, He who eats this bread will live forever. That was John 6, 58. Now in verse 51 where he says the same thing, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Now, what bread is he talking about? We'll look again at verse 51. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Jesus is talking about the flesh that he will give for the life of the world. The question you need to ask is, was the flesh that Jesus gave for the life of the world real or symbolic? And when did he give his flesh for the life of the world? On the cross. So the flesh that Jesus wants us to eat and the blood he wants us to drink is the flesh that he gave for the life of the world. In other words, the flesh that was nailed to the cross and the blood that was spilled on the cross. 
That is the flesh that he wants us to eat, and that is the blood that he wants us to drink. The question I ask of you and the question you need to ask of anyone who says Jesus is speaking symbolically in John 6 or that Jesus is speaking symbolically at the Last Supper is this. Was Jesus' death on the cross real or symbolic? Was the body on the cross, the flesh on the cross, real or symbolic? Was the blood shed on the cross real or symbolic? If you believe Jesus is speaking symbolically in John 6 when he says, eat my body and drink my blood, then the conclusion you come to is that Jesus did not really die on the cross. It was only a symbolic representation of the body and blood of Christ, not the real thing. After all, the bread he is talking about us eating is the flesh that he will give for the life of the world. If he's talking about giving us his symbolic flesh to eat, then he is talking about giving us his symbolic flesh for the life of the world. Again, if you believe Jesus is talking symbolically in John 6, then you must also conclude that the flesh that Jesus gave on the cross for the life of the world was only his symbolic flesh. You cannot have it both ways. This is my body. This is my blood. Thank you. For more information or to obtain a copy of this talk, please check out the Bible Christian Society website at www.biblechristiansociety.com or send a letter to the Bible Christian Society, P.O. Box 424, Pleasant Grove, Alabama, 35127. Thank you, and may God bless you.